Today I'm going to show you how to create an endless background in Unity. What's up guys? I recently found the need to have my background constantly repeating no matter how far my character moves along the screen. This is commonly found in endless runner style games. So I wrote a quick script to help us accomplish this goal. It's actually rather simple, so go ahead and open up Unity and let's get started. For this example, I just have a simple scene set up in Unity, but feel free to use this in any project you may be working on. I went ahead and downloaded the free assets from our website and sliced up a few different sprites. My goal here is to be able to drag these sprites onto the scene and then have the script duplicate and move them around so they constantly loop throughout the scene. Previously, I had accomplished this task by using millions of objects and placing them manually, but having a ton of objects on the scene can really slow down the performance of your game. So I knew there had to be a better way. But before I begin, I just want to remind you that all the code used in this video can be copied and pasted from our website, or if you're a Patreon subscriber, you can download this entire project from our Patreon portal. Okay, let's begin. The first thing we want to do is create a C -sharp script called background loop and attach it to our main camera. Then I want to create a public list containing game objects called levels. A list is basically an array and this will contain all the background objects we want to loop. Next, I want to create a reference for our main camera by writing private camera, main camera. Then lastly, I need to store the boundaries of this camera, so let's create a private vector to called screen bounds. So then first and foremost, let's define our main camera to the object that is holding the script by writing main camera equals game object dot get component camera. And then now that we have our main camera defined, we can figure out the dimensions of this camera in world space by writing screen bounds equals main camera dot screen to world point, and then in parentheses write new vector three, and for the x parameter write screen dot width, then screen dot height, and lastly main camera dot transform dot position dot z. I've covered this line of code in almost all my videos, but basically what it does is it takes the screen width and height and plots it on an x and y axis. Once you finish with that, the next thing we want to do is create a function to load all our sprites so they fill the screen. So let's write void load child objects and then as parameter write game object and as a reference name let's put obj. For now I'm just going to write debug.log and in parentheses I'm going to put obj.name so we can write to our console to make sure that our script is working. Then back in our start function we want to cycle through the game objects in our list and then execute the function for each of them. We can do this by using a for each loop. So go ahead and write for each and in parentheses write game object obj in levels. This creates a local reference called obj which contains the value of our current row in the list. With that we can execute our function load child objects and pass this obj as a reference. What this basically does now is goes through our list of sprites and executes the load child objects for each sprite we have in our list. We can test this out by going back into Unity and expanding our levels reference in our inspector. Go ahead and change the value of size to equal the amount of sprites you'd like to loop in the background. I currently have six objects that I'd like to loop, so I'm going to write six for this field and press the enter key. After this is done, you should see six empty fields created below our levels reference. Now I'm going to want to assign each object to one of these empty fields and then press play. <laughs> if done properly, we should see our console populated with the names of each game object that was added to our list. What we want to do next is clone each one of these game objects so there's enough to fill the width of the screen. To do that, let's edit our load child objects function and just go ahead and delete our debug.log line. Then the first thing we want to do is figure out what the width of the current sprite is. So let's write float object width equals obj dot get component sprite renderer then put bounds dot size dot x. This will give us the horizontal value of the boundary box of the sprite. Then we need to figure out how many clones we need to make to fill the width of the screen. We can do this by dividing the object width by the screen width times two. So let's write int childs needed equals screen bounds dot x times two divided by object width. Since screen bounds and object width are floats, we need to convert them to an integer by writing int in parentheses, or we will get an error. Then I also want to round this number up because we need to make sure that we have enough clones to fill the screen. We can do this easily by wrapping our dividing statement by mathf.seal. Next we want to clone our project object so we have a mold that we can use as a reference. Let's do that by writing game object clone equals instantiate obj as game object. 
Then let's create a loop that will create all of our child objects by writing for int i equals zero, i is less than equal to child's needed, and then i plus plus. Then let's create a clone by writing game object c equals instantiate clone as game object. Then we want to set this new clone to become a child object of our parent object by writing c.transform.setParent and put obj.transform in parentheses. Then we want to space out these one after each other, and we can do this by multiplying the x position by i. So let's write c.transform.position equals new vector 3, and then for the x parameter, put object width times i, and then for the y and z parameter, let's just set them equal to the same value as our parent object. And then you don't have to do this part, but to keep things clean, we can modify the name of this child object by writing c.name equals obj.name plus i. Then let's delete our clone object by writing destroy and then put clone in parentheses. You might be wondering why we created a clone object to use as reference instead of just using obj. Well, the reason is because as we start adding children objects to obj, those child objects would be cloned as well. Instead, we need a copy of obj to use for each child. Then lastly, we can go ahead and remove the sprite renderer component on our parent object. It's no longer needed. So let's write destroy obj.getComponent sprite renderer. If done correctly, when we play this in Unity, we should see that all of our objects are cloned and spaced out to fit the width of the camera. Although if you have a wide camera, you might see that your background isn't quite seamless yet. But don't worry, we will fix that next. But if you move the camera towards the center of these objects, you should see that they now fit the entire width of the camera, plus a little bit more. So back in our editor, we want to execute a function for each background object that will reposition their children so they are always filling the screen. For this, we will use late update, which is called each frame, but after the update function is called. And then again, let's write a for each loop with a game object reference called obj to loop through our list called levels. Then let's execute a function that we're about to create called reposition child objects and pass obj as a parameter. Next, let's create a new line and write void reposition child objects. And as a parameter, let's do game object called obj. Then we want to create a list of all the child objects that are in obj by writing transform with the square bracket and let's name this children and set it equal to obj.getComponents in children and then transform. Then we're going to write a script that checks to see if the camera extends past the edge of either the first child or the last child and then repositions the children accordingly. For example, if the camera moves past the right edge, we will take the first child and move it so it covers the right edge and vice versa for the left edge. In this case, the first child in the list will always be on the left and the last child will always be on the right. So to avoid erroring out, let's check to make sure there are more than one child in our list by writing if children.length is greater than one. Then all we really care about is the first child and the last child. So let's define these by writing game object first child equals children and then put one in a square bracket and then dot game object. We use the index of one for the first child because an index of zero is the parent object. Then let's write game object last child equals children. And then in square brackets, let's subtract children.length minus one and then put dot game object. The last thing we want to define is half our objects width. The reason for this is because the transform position is in the center of the object. So if we add or subtract half the width, we will get the X value of the edge of the object. So let's write float half object width equals last child dot get component sprite renderer dot bounds and because we want the half width let's use extents instead of size and then put dot x now we just need to create two if statements the first will detect if the camera is exposing the right edge of the background element we can do this by writing if transform dot position dot x plus screen bounds dot x is greater than last child dot transform dot position dot x plus half object width then if this is true, we want to move our first child to the end of our children list by writing first child dot transform dot set as last sibling. Then let's set the position of the first child to be at the right edge of the last child object. Let's do that by writing first child dot transform dot position equals new vector three. And then parentheses write last child dot transform dot position dot x plus half object width times two. And then set the y and z parameter to equal the same as the last child position. Then for our second if statement, we just reverse everything. So let's write else if transform.position.x minus screen bounds.x is less than 
first child dot transform dot position dot x minus half object width. So then if this is true again, let's reverse everything. So set the last child to be the first sibling. And then set the last child's position to be the left of the first child position. We do this with first child dot transform dot position dot x minus half object width times two. Now this script isn't perfect yet. If you notice, there are very small spaces between our sprites. I could probably fix this in Photoshop, but another solution is to add a choke element. Basically what this will do is make our sprites come in on both sides so that it covers a small white space in between sprites. So back in our script, we can define that by writing public float choke at the top. Then we're going to subtract this value in two places. The first is in our load child objects function when we define our object width. And then the second is in our reposition child objects function when we define our half object width. Then back in our inspector, if we play with this value, we should see better results. For now, I'm just going to put 0 0.25. And there you have it. You now have a seamless background that loops indefinitely at any speed. We covered a lot of code in this video, so head over to pressstart.vip if you'd rather copy and paste the source code. In our next video, we will use the script from this video to implement a parallax scrolling element, so make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss that video. And lastly, if you found value in this video, please consider joining our Patreon. Patreon subscribers can download entire projects and receive access to our videos a week before anyone else.